Hi everyone, my name is Renit Billen and it is an honor and privilege to be a part of this workshop with you and to be involved in this conversation. First and foremost, a huge congratulations to all of you for all that you've accomplished at such a young age and for being named one of the Queen's Young Leaders. I have had the opportunity to go through the highlights and to go through your accomplishments and I have to say that it is such an honor um, and I am in absolute awe at the work that you're doing. I look forward to seeing how you progress through your careers and to stay connected with you and also to learn from your experiences and to share my own. So as I mentioned, I will be um, hosting this workshop on empathy and leadership and I do hope to make it as interactive as possible. So you will notice that you do have a worksheet um, as a part of this workshop, so I will post some questions to you as we go through the curriculum, and I'll also post some questions for Twitter where I hope to converse with you there. We will be using the hashtag um, LCCAMB, and I do hope and encourage you to participate, and I look forward to seeing your responses and engaging with you in that way. It is great to e-meet you. Please do stay connected. And if you do have any questions regarding the workshop, feel free to email me, send me a tweet, or connect with me on LinkedIn. I am happy to respond to any questions that you may have and also to stay connected and learn more about what it is that you're doing. A brief background as to who I am. Um, I am a social entrepreneur, so I have been running a for-profit organization for over 10 years now that deals with recruitment in the education sector. At a very young age, I um, learned uh, the fact that uh, small businesses come and go, and what that encouraged me to do is to think about how I wanted to make an impact. So I changed my business model, and instead of working just towards profit, we now work towards two bottom lines, which is making an impact as well as the profit piece. So for the past nine years, we've been building schools, we built a teacher's college in Kenya, um, we've supported scholarship programs in Peru, Ecuador, and um, different places in Africa as well. Uh, we supported a Breakfast for Learning uh, program here in Canada, and I continue to want to make a difference in the education space. I'm also an educator, so I do teach um, at a local college in Toronto, Ontario, a very warm welcome from Canada, it is snowing today, um, and I teach courses on leadership and social entrepreneurship. I get to speak with my students about different concepts on leadership and also try to facilitate an environment where they can learn about the concepts and apply it to their specific context. I'm very interested in research related to global competency and that's where um, I did my research for my PhD which I completed last year and now I'm looking at research into emotional intelligence and how we can develop that among leaders. Again, it is a privilege to be here and to connect with you virtually and I do hope we can continue that conversation. Please do feel free to connect and I hope you enjoy the, uh, the workshop. Welcome and speak with you very soon. Bye. All right, so for today's conversation, we are going to look at what I like to call the three U's, and this includes understanding ourselves, understanding others, and understanding the context. I did mention in my welcome video that I am a social entrepreneur, and with this, I have been able to travel to different parts of our world. I have engaged in experiences that have changed my life in ways that I can't even express, and these experiences showed me what it means to believe and possibility. Um, when I think about understanding ourselves, others, and context, I'm reminded of the fact that it's so important to be at the ground level, to have a heightened self-awareness, and also to come from a place of understanding when working with others and wanting to develop solutions to problems and issues and situations that may be at hand. We will end this workshop by connecting empathy and leadership, and I will provide a few notes on moving for it as well. So with that, let's begin. We can't begin to understand others without first understanding ourselves. So let's take the following point into consideration. No two people will interpret the exact same experience in the exact same way. And when we look at that point, it is actually quite profound. What I'm trying to express is that 
um, through an example, no two people in this workshop will interpret it in the exact same way. No two people going through the Queen's Leadership Program are going to interpret that experience in the exact same way. And when we consider why that is, it, it comes to a point where we want to understand that our past experiences have shaped how we perceive the world and how we interpret the situations that we go through. So what does that mean and why do we care? Well, when we want to consider what makes us who we are, we want to look at the experiences that have shaped us. And when we think about experiences, I'd, I'd like to um, mention that an experience isn't an experience until we make meaning out of it. And how do we make meaning? Well, we make meaning through reflection. So there may have be, been instances that we have gone through that we have not yet made meaning out of those experiences, but yet shape how we view and perceive the world. And if we are interacting with people in a specific way, or if we are looking at situations through a a different lens, we want to take that step back to understand what has shaped how we view the world, and more importantly, what makes us who we are. Some argue that it's nature that makes us who we are, and others say that it's nurture. It's our environment, it's the people we surround ourselves with, it's the opportunities that we may have access to, and some may say that it's a mixture of both. But when we consider nature versus nurture, or nature and nurture as making us who we are, we want to understand that we have interpreted all of these variables that surround us and we've interpreted them in a specific way. The experiences we've exposed ourselves to have shaped the way we perceive the world and this makes us who we are. And what we believe about the world and how we've perceived it to be, it matters. And it matters and we see that in our day-to-day -day interactions and all that we do and what it is that we want to achieve. A big piece of that as well is the environment. So understanding your environment, which we'll get into a little bit later, but for this piece, it's understanding which pieces or parts of the environment, which variables impact who I am. Understanding ourselves is so critical in everything that we do. Understanding our assumptions, understanding our biases, and understanding where it is that we come from and the lens that we choose to perceive the world in can only help us as we begin to continue to tackle the issues that are at hand. So let's now take it to Twitter. If you're able to open up your Twitter account, I'd like to begin the conversation by posing the following question. How does where I live impact who I am? So for your response, if you could please use capital A1 with a colon, as well as the hashtag LCCAMB, that would be awesome. And we can begin a conversation about our different perspectives as to what we believe, um, uh, the, how the, our environment impacts who we are. So please take a moment, respond to the question, and I will meet you at the next slide. So I hope you've had a chance to post your response um, to the, the Twitter question that I've just asked, and I hope you had a chance to view how others responded as well. When we think about where we live, some may think that it doesn't impact who we are, but it absolutely does, because it contributes to the environment that we're exposed to. Now, it does impact who we are, and I'll give you an example um, of one of my students uh, who, she was a part of my leadership course, and she grew up in a war-torn country, and every time that they would go to the market, they would always purchase extra food, just in case. And she shared this story about how growing up, it was this mentality of just in case we always have to uh, protect ourselves and make sure that we're taken care of. And and her family had moved to Canada, they immigrated here, and although we are not a war-torn country, every time she now goes to the grocery store to get food, she always buys extra food just in case. 
And this is kind of embedded into the way she views the world that you never know when something's going to happen and you always have to be prepared. And now her children are being exposed to that just in case um, kind of mentality as well. And it's impacting her actions and what she believes about the world. And I had another student who lives in the greater Toronto area, and she spoke about how she lives in an area that's considered to be a little more rough than other neighborhoods. And she spoke about the fact that she has seen um, people break into homes, um, engage in theft, and, and she has to hide her money in her socks whenever she goes out. And reflecting deeper on the question of how does where I live impact who I am, she was talking about how this has impacted the way in which um, or the extent to which she trusts others. And it impacts the way she interacts with others and how she perceives the world to be. So if we look at the question, how does where I live impact who I am, we can understand that there are different variables um, that impact what we view about the world and that shape us and shape how we perceive the world. But if this is true and we come to each situation with our own perspectives that have been shaped by the environment, then it's also true for others that they come to situations with their own beliefs about themselves and the world based on their own experiences. To every situation, we bring with us our own experiences and perceptions. Well, it's also true that others do as well. So it's not a matter of whether we're right or wrong or whether one is good and one is bad. It's just that it is. These are the experiences that we've had and it has shaped how we interact with others and what we perceive the world to be. The point of this um, piece of the, the module is that we want to take a step back and consider the variables that have contributed to us, to this and to our understanding. It's critical for us to do this in order to build heightened self-awareness. There are certain things that we believe to be fundamentally true about ourselves. There are certain things that we believe to be fundamentally true about others as well as the world. To start listing these things and why we've developed the perceptions that we have will allow us to understand where we're coming from as we approach situations, as we approach issues, as well as how we approach problems and the solutions that we create. So I'd like you to bring up your worksheet, or if you have it in front of you, and pause this video to fill out the first question um, that is included on the worksheet. This question asks you, what do you fundamentally believe to be true about yourself? When answering this question, I don't want you to write down or jot down what others think of you or what others have said about you. I'd like you to really be reflective um, and honest in your reflection about what you believe to be true about yourself. So take some time and do that and I will meet you on the other side of the slide. So when we think about the piece of understanding ourselves, I'd love for you to consider that an experience is not an experience until we make meaning out of it. As I mentioned earlier, we make meaning through reflection. And taking that time each and every day, whether it's five minutes or 10 minutes in the morning or in the evening, or perhaps during the day while you're having a tea or a coffee, um, Take the time to reflect. Reflect on your experiences, how you are interpreting them, and the impact that they're having on how you perceive the world to be. Understanding ourselves requires honest and authentic self-reflection. It requires you to be honest and it requires you to look deep within yourself and to be introspective because no one knows you better than yourself. An exercise that you can do, if you'd like to, is to think about what um, what you've gone through throughout the day, to look back and to see if you could have handled that situation differently and what the outcome could be. This is something that I like to engage in um, once a week at the end of the week, and because I find that I'm I'm able to be a lot more 
objective at that point. And I do this so that in future situations I can learn from my past experiences and have a greater understanding of why it is that I view certain things to be the way that they are. I'd like to wrap up the piece about understanding ourselves with the following quote by Deepak Chopra. Deepak Chopra says, Our minds influence the key activity of the brain, which then influences everything. Perception, cognition, thoughts and feelings, personal relationships, they're all a projection of you. So the next section that we're going to talk about is understanding others. And I'm going to start off this section by providing two examples. One example is from a trip that I had abroad, and another example is from my leadership class here in Canada. So a few years ago, I traveled to Ecuador, and I was working with three rural communities, and I was going there to help build a school. And a few years ago, they had very limited access to education. The children weren't attending school. The f parents didn't want them to go to school, and members of the community just weren't interested. And so as I was traveling there, I remember being on the flight, um, and I, I remember writing down a list of recommendations. And in my mind, I thought, you know, I'm really going to help improve the situation of education in Ecuador and specifically in these communities. And I thought I had all of the answers. And when I stepped foot into the communities, I recognized immediately that if I had implemented any one of my recommendations, they would have completely failed. And as I was there, um, the first thing I had to do was build trust and not go in there and tell them what I thought they needed to do or what I thought the education system needed to be like. And as I was there, I conducted interviews with children in the community, with parents and with different members of the community. And I realized that the children didn't want to go to school and their parents didn't want them to go to school as well because they were working in the fields to provide um, for food for the family. And education was seen as it's something that was very intangible, whereas working in the field during the day was seen as something tangible. And their number one priority was to eat as opposed to sending their school their kids to school and there was this larger systemic issue. And it took me that situation to realize that I was coming in to those communities with my preconceived notions of what I thought was right for them and I say right with quotation marks around it, um, I came in with my assumptions and I came in with my biases and I was completely wrong. And so that's, that's I believe that's a bigger example, but something that we do in our day-to-day -day lives, I'm going to give you the example of my leadership class um, to kind of lay out what I'm trying to express here, which is the following. Uh, on the first day of my leadership class, I asked my students, for those of you who did not know me or knew who I was, how many of you thought that I would be male? And my class laughs and a lot of their hands go up. And when I ask them why, and I do this every single semester, I ask them why they thought I would be male, I get the exact same responses. And a lot of them say that it's because of my name. And my name is Ramit Billen. It's neither male nor female. Um, but the automatic assumption that was made by majority of the class that didn't know who I was, was that I would be male. And they were obviously incorrect. So when we think about both of these examples, what I want us to consider is what assumptions are we making based on the limited information that we have? Well, we're making assumptions every single day. When we meet someone, perhaps it's based on what they look like, what their position title is, we make assumptions and we have these biases and we do this because we're trying to label and to, to understand others um, and to understand kind of what we're getting into. But the bigger question is, what if our initial assumption was incorrect to begin with? 
So what if we are going into situations with limited information and what if we are wrong? How does that then impact the projects that we're working on, the solutions that we're trying to implement, and more importantly, how does that impact those we work with, whether it's professionally or the communities that we're in, and how does that impact our understanding of others? We have to go back to knowing that we come to each situation with our own assumptions. This goes back into the previous piece that we talked about in understanding ourselves. But when we connect this to understanding others, we are coming with assumptions and biases and preconceived notions, and we want to see, are we as informed as we should be when developing solutions or perhaps even interacting with others? So let's take this to Twitter. And if you could, again, use the hashtag LCCAMB. And in your response, if you could use A2 with a colon, I'd love for you to answer the following question. How may someone react or feel when they believe that they are not being understood? So think about a time where perhaps you felt as though you were misunderstood or perhaps you were in an experience where someone else may have felt as though they were being misunderstood. How may someone react or feel when they aren't being understood? If you could post your responses to that, that would be wonderful. And I'll see you on the next slide. So feeling misunderstood can be uncomfortable, can feel uneasy, and can also lead to frustration. So when we think about the projects that we working or that we're working on as well as different situations that we encounter, we want to understand that people come from different perspectives and it's important for them to be heard. And when we think about the piece of being heard, we want to we wanna make sure that we um, grasp the fact that messages are conveyed through different channels. And some of these channels include verbal. So when we think about words, the words that we use, the language that we use, um, but more importantly, the words in the emails and the text messages or the messages that we post on social media, all of these um, verbal type of communications that we're engaging in express a specific message. There are also nonverbal cues that we take from others um, that contribute to how we're expressing ourselves. So this can include our body language, uh, the way in which we present ourselves, what our posture is like, whether we have our hands crossed in front of our chests, um, the whether we're standing in a pose that is seen as powerful or something that's seen as vulnerable. We give off cues on the messages that we're trying to convey with our verbal and nonverbal messages as well as our tone of voice. So when we think about understanding others, we want to know that they're conveying their messages, but what we're interpreting actually depends on their verbal or the words that they use, the nonverbal, as well as the tone of voice. And if our channels are not consistent, whether we are the one relaying that message or the one receiving that message, this is where inconsistencies or misunderstandings can occur. Also, when responding to the question of how someone may react or feel when they feel as though they're being misunderstood, we want to consider what barriers may exist that can lead to that understanding. Is it something that um, we come with um, that is creating a barrier which makes another person feel as though they're misunderstood? Perhaps it's someone's body language that acts as a barrier, so it leads to misunderstandings. So when we think about miscommunication or perhaps on the inability to understand what someone is trying to say or the message that they're trying to convey, we want to take a step back and consider the barriers that may exist in order um, and that may hinder that. So the example that I used earlier about being in Ecuador and doing research and speaking with the students, um, when I 
I spoke with the students in the community, I actually had to use two translators. So what my question was, was said in English, which was then translated to Spanish, which was then translated to Quechua, which was then um, spoken to the student I was interviewing. And when we think about communication and the different channels that we use, there is so much that may have been lost in communication that I myself wouldn't be aware of. So this piece about understanding others is a critical one and understanding that there may be barriers that exist and this can have a huge impact on the projects that we're working on and those we lead and those we interact with. So in your worksheet, if you could take a few moments to fill out the second question, the second question asks you, what can you do in your role, whichever role that is, that could help others feel understood? So what are some strategies that you can use um, or some things that you can do to create an environment where others feel as though they are being heard and that they are understood? So please pause this video and take the time to answer that reflection question. The final piece that we want to look at in this uh, space of understanding others is the language that we use to describe, define, and categorize. And we do use common words in order to make sense of things, um, to try to understand situations or to understand people. And when we think about it from a personal perspective, self-talk is the language that we use that makes emotions real. So we do want to consider the language that we're using and whether or not that's limiting ourselves and also limiting the way that we view others or perceive others. When we want to consider the concept of understanding others, this does require an honest look at personal assumptions. It's considering what assumptions and biases we are bringing to the table that um, allow us or that provoke us to view others in a specific way. We want to challenge our assumptions, we want to challenge our biases, and also reframe issues by looking at them from a different perspective. And when we engage in this, what we can do is we can create, cultivate, and nurture meaningful relationships. And understanding others is the basis of that. We want to create relationships that are mutually beneficial and to nurture them and, and, and create these meaningful networks that can help us uh, achieve what it is that we want to achieve and to create the programs that we want to do that can then have a lasting impact. Before we get into this section of understanding context, I'd like to leave you with the following quote. We have few names and few definitions for an infinity of single things. Therefore, recourse to the universal is not strength of thought, but weakness of discourse. So again, please consider the language that you use and how you make your emotions real as well as how you make understanding others and understanding our world real for you. So the third U is understanding context. And the example I'll give you here is of a not-for-profit organization that was building a school in South America. And I wasn't a part of this organization, but um, I had a colleague who was. And they worked with this not-for-profit, and they collected donations from individuals who were wanting to help with the project to build a school. And then they took a, um, an entire delegation down to this community in South America to build the school. Um, people went, they went for a couple weeks, they built the school, and then they went back uh, to their respective homes. Six months later, the not-for-profit organization sent a representative back to the community to see the school um, and to see how it was functioning. And when they went there, they were very disappointed and actually quite angry because the school wasn't being used. No one was attending the school. And so when uh, the member of the not-for-profit, they asked the community, well, we came in, we built this school, and um, no one's using it. Why is that? 
the community members responded that there wasn't um, a separation for girls washrooms and washrooms for boys and they wouldn't send their girls to school because they wanted the washrooms to be separate. And this may sound silly or this may sound as though it's something very small and this isn't why someone shouldn't send their child to school. However, it was something that was important to the community and it's something that they valued. And the bigger um, kind of lesson to learn here is that no one asked them. No one asked uh, or received their input as to whether or not what they were building would be a place that they would send their children. And so if they simply put a sign that separated the girls' washrooms or restrooms from the boys' restrooms, the children would go to school. And that's exactly what they did. It was a very simple fix to a larger problem. But more importantly, they, they, we had to understand context, we had to um, understand the reality at the ground level in order to make the fix, and we just needed to ask. And that something that we see as something very small was very important to that community. When we think about understanding context, there's often a rural and urban divide. So you can look at scope from very diff uh, so from many different perspectives. You can look at it from the city, uh, the province, uh, the nation, the continent, our world. Your scope depends on your perspective. But even in um, a country, there are often divides within that country as well. So what may work in one area um, may not work in a very different area. And I often find with the research that I do is that there is this divide between rural communities and urban communities and issues are sometimes very systemic. What we want to do to understand context is we want to gather necessary information. We want to gather information at the ground level. I can read about different things that occur um, in different parts um, in our world, but to actually understand and to gain that understanding, being at the ground level, asking the people that I'm working with the right questions is necessary in order for me to understand context and context matters. I'd like to share with you this quote and then um, we'll pose the question on Twitter as well. Crossley and Watson say, it is not possible to borrow educational policy and practice from one context and transfer to another with any real hope of the transplant being successful. Many government and international agencies still do not appear to recognize this today. I think that this is a very powerful quote um, and this quote actually has a lot of meaning to it. So before I respond to it, what I'd like us to do is I'd like us to take it to Twitter. So here is your final question for this workshop. Um, so again, if you could go to your Twitter account and what I've done is I've put the quote on the right side here and the question I'd like to pose to you is what do you think is meant by this quote? And in your response, if again, you could use the hashtag LCCAMB, as well as the capital letter A, three and a colon for your response, that would be fantastic. And I'm very interested in reading what you think is meant by this quote. So take the time to do that and I'll see you on the next slide. So I think that we can all agree that developing context-specific solutions with the work that we are engaged in is very important, um, as well as for leaders, the idea that flexibility is important as well. What may work in one situation or with one individual may not work in a different context. So doing a needs assessment, asking the right questions, being involved in the ground level is very important. And as leaders, what we also want to consider is the importance of flexibility. We are working in environments that are ever-changing, where dynamics continue to change, relationships continue to change, and consider for yourself, how do you react to an unfamiliar environment? 
As we know, and as you may already know from your lived experiences, flexi flexibility is important, and this focuses on the ability to adapt to an unpredictable environment as well as context. And this requires us to be responsive to change in a constructive way, which is such an important piece for leaders as well as developing empathy. So please do take the time to go to your worksheet um, and fill out the third question, which asks, what are some specific things that you can do to better understand the environment and context that you are working in? So I would love for you to reflect on the things that you currently do and perhaps list a few new things that you can do to better understand your environment and the context of the projects that you're involved in um, and the people that you work with. So please press pause, take the time to respond, and I will see you on the next slide. So the final piece of our workshop is looking at empathy and connecting it with leadership. Empathy seeks shared meaning. So what, it, what this means is that what we're trying to use is another person's reference points in order to make understanding of what they may be going through. Now, this can be difficult when we haven't experienced the situation ourselves or haven't experienced it firsthand. And many times um, our automatic response is to say, I know how you feel. But I discourage that because if we go back to the first component of what we discussed in terms of understanding ourselves, we all have different experiences. So I can't know how someone feels because they have their own set of experiences that influenced how they interpret a situation. So the point of empathy is not to know how someone feels. However, what it encourages us to do is to put our assumptions, biases, and perspectives aside in order to use another person's reference points to have a deeper understanding of what they are going through and the situation at hand. We can't begin to seek shared meaning without, again, understanding ourselves, what our assumptions are, what our preconceived notions are, what biases we may bring to the situation. All of these things contribute to our perspective as we've already discussed. So how this connects to empathy is we want to put these assumptions and biases in our perspective, whether it agrees or disagrees with the situation at hand, we want to put that aside. Because being empathetic requires us to use another's reference points, not our own. And that is critical when we think about empathy in leadership. We are not trying to use our past experiences, our reference points, in order to understand. Because that understanding comes from our own experiences. What we want to use is the other's reference points. And this is where we can display empathy. When connecting empathy and leadership, this does involve the three U's that we've discussed, and that is understanding yourself, understanding others, and understanding context. What we can do when we decide to take a step back, engage in um, very honest and authentic reflection and go through the process of understanding our experiences, understanding the way we interpret the messages conveyed by others, and also understanding the variables um, that contribute to the context that we're working in, what we can do is build meaningful relationships. We can heighten our self-awareness and we can create a shared understanding of the problems that we're trying to address and solve. So these three U's play a deep role in leadership and empathy, and we want to get to a point where we can be objective and reframe the problems that we're trying to solve, look at the way that we're interacting with others, and develop a deeper understanding of those that we are working with and impacting. We do this, and it first starts with self. So as I've mentioned, the benefits, 
benefits are an increased self-awareness, building and cultivating these meaningful relationships, and also being empathetic with the work that we do. The work that you do is having a lasting impact on others. I've, As I've mentioned, I've gone through your accomplishments and achievements, and again, I'm in awe. You're having this lasting impact on the lives of others. And I would suggest you are being empathetic in the work that you do, or, or you wouldn't have been able to achieve as much as you have at such a young age. What we want to do, and what I encourage you to do, is to take that a step further and a step deeper. Take that time to reflect, to understand, to understand yourself, understand others, and to understand context. It's here that we live in possibility. It's here that we can create solutions that perhaps we couldn't think of before. And it's here that we can display empathy and be the most effective leaders that we can be. Daniel Pink says, empathy is about standing in someone else's shoes, feeling with his or her heart, seeing with his or her eyes, Not only is empathy hard to outsource and automate, but it makes the world a better place. What I want to do is I want to take the time to thank you for participating in this workshop and more importantly for all that you do. The impact that you are having, I cannot stress um, how incredible it is and how incredible it is for me to see all that you've done and I can't wait to see all that you continue to do. I do hope that you enjoyed the workshop, the Twitter component, and the worksheet questions. I look forward to responding as well. Um, And I do hope that we can keep the conversation going, and I do hope that we can stay connected. I wish you the best of luck with all that you do, um, and I do hope you enjoy the program. I have left for you on the next slide my contact information. Please do reach out, and again, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you for having me a part of your workshop series.